right, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. I'm glad you guys have made it. And uh, hope you guys have had a good week. If you're watching with us online tonight, we're glad you have joined us. We're going to be in John chapter 14 tonight. We are continuing our series. We're kind of almost halfway through with a series called Conversations with Christ. We are in John chapter 14 tonight as we have worked our way through the first four weeks. We were in John 13. We spent the last week in the first part of the chapter. And we'll be in John chapter 14 also again tonight beginning around verse 15. So whether you're here in the room with us or whether you're online, go ahead and turn to John chapter John chapter 14. So as we've been looking through this over the last several weeks, we have seen that Jesus talked about how all things were in his hands. We know that uh, he demonstrated uh, servant's attitude as well as the gospel in, in his washing of the, of the disciples' feet. Uh, we have seen him deal and have a couple of conversations with Judas before Judas left to go betray him. We have seen Jesus' command to love and even tell his disciples, hey, he's leaving, but they can't follow him right now. And last week we saw him in the wake of saying, I'm leaving, but he also told them, don't be troubled, don't be worried. And uh, he said, why not? We can't go where you're going. He said, yeah, you know the way, I am the way. And that's where we left things off last week. So we're going to continue this evening picking up that conversation. And uh, as we get there, we're going to begin tonight with some prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful tonight for the opportunity to come and look at your word, do a little study, to, uh, to fellowship, or to enjoy the company you've given us, the family you've provided for us here at London First Baptist. Lord, I pray that your spirit, as we'll read about tonight, would in fact be active in our hearts and minds tonight, uh, uniting us with you in a fresh way, teaching us and reminding us of all that you've said. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. John chapter 14, I'm going to begin reading in verse 15, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live, you will live also. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what that has happened that you're going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and, when we, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which, you're hear, which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You heard that I said to you, I go away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now I've told you before it happens, so that when it happens you may believe. I will not speak much more with you, for the rule of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let's go from here. Now, a lot of that is, can, can be confusing. There's a, there's a lot of, um, what in the world is he talking about type of stuff in there that seems a little bit mysterious. So let's see if we can work our way through this. Now remember in verse 12, which we looked at last week, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. And so he Jesus had just told them a few moments before the passage we read just now that they would do great works because he's going to the Father. That, that's the actual thing. Because he's leaving, they're going to do these things. In fact, his leaving was even necessary. It's part of a, 
a planned program. It's part of the progress of God's, uh, God's purposes that he leaves, and then the disciples pick up these deeds. And the connection, even in verse 13 and 14, that next verse is one that people like, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. And we think to ourselves, what in the world is Jesus talking about? That means I can just pray anything? Just tag on his name to the end and I'll get whatever I ask for? Well, of course not. That's attached to verse 12. It's attached to doing the works of God. So Jesus has said, listen, I'm leaving, and don't worry, the work I'm doing doesn't leave with me. I may be leaving, but the work is going to continue, and you're going to do it, and you're going to take it further than I have. And I have to, give, I have to go so that that takes place. And as you are doing my work in my name that I've given you to do, you ask whatever you, with, you, ask whatever you want in the process, and that's going to happen. So th- those, those things are all attached together. So that's what we saw at the end of last week. Um, now, as he, as he does this, he says in verse 15, as he's making the transition from if asking anything in his name, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, this is repeated several times here. He says it in verse 15. He also says it in verse 21. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Verse 23 and 24, he says the same thing. If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. Um, so all this idea of doing the works that Christ had done and continuing that work, in fact, continuing to do the things that God has told us to do, to be obedient, this is a sign, Jesus says, that in fact there is a love relationship. It's going to attach us to everything else uh, going on. Now, before we get too much further into that, I want to, I want to share with you, I think, what's the things, one of the things that's really going on here. Jesus is changing for the disciples, the way they understand or the way they act or the way they're going to interact as disciples. So we know that Jesus has been with them for about three years. So if you've been a disciple of Jesus for three years, if you're you're Thomas or Peter, what has life looked like for the last three years being a disciple of Jesus? Okay, you follow him around. And you do what he does, you go where he goes, and, and, and how do you know where he's going? Oh, there he is, I'll go that way. <laughs> he's, he's right there. And how do you listen to him? <laughs> you, you, you get the He's there, right? And everything you know about being a disciple is, well, he's there. So, oh, he's leaving that. Okay, we go there, we go there too. And every once in a while, Jesus gives them assignments. Jesus says, I want you guys to take off two by two, and you're going to go on a little mission trip. And they say, well, what are we supposed to do? And he gives them details. You guys go do this, and we'll check in here in a few weeks. Or he says, uh, guys, I want you all to go over there to that little boy, pick up some feet, pick up some loaves and fishes, and then we're going to get them all here, and you all go to pass it out. He gives them directions, and when he says do something, they, they do it, right? That's what disciples do. So that's what they've known. Now, we also know that his, his understanding of Messiah is something he's been trying to get them to understand because their, their understanding of Messiah is a little different than his, or at least they, they haven't fully grasped all that he's there to do. But mostly, what they do is they hang out with Jesus. <laughs> Wherever he goes, they go. He gives them assignments. They do it, and it's, it's very simple. There's, there's not a whole lot of you know, difficulty about that, right? And now he's changing everything, because now what's happening? Well, he's leaving. So if you're a disciple of Jesus, and all you know about being a disciple means hanging out with him, and he says, well, you're still going to be my disciples, but I just won't be here anymore. Now what are you thinking? Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, what? <laughs> um. I, I, it was kind of funny. I, I thought about this this afternoon. You know, the, the model for school two years ago here was to be in a classroom with a teacher, right? What has COVID introduced to us? <laughs> Virtual school. We're not actually in the room with the teacher. We can, hopefully we can see them. Now, I'm being a little bit <laughs> facetious here, but that's different, right? That's a, that's a whole different thing. And it's been difficult for a lot of people to, to get a handle on. Well, This isn't exactly virtual, but Jesus basically says, I won't be here. You're still my disciples, 
And by the way, you're still going to be working. You're still going to be learning. You're still going to be doing everything I tell you to do. I just won't be here. And is that computing for them? Would it compute for us? Yeah. Because the things he's getting ready to talk about with the Spirit don't, you know, (laughs) I know this is the way I do it. He's there, I go there. I hear his voice, literally I hear his voice, and he says, do something, and I do that. Now, Jesus is talking about something completely different. I have a feeling the disciples aren't much different from us. They probably have difficulty with change. Anybody else? Has anybody else every once in a while had a difficulty with doing things in a different way? Yeah. Now, I have to admit, I've, um, I think I'm in the minority. I think I've been this way throughout most of my life. I've always thought change was kind of exciting. It's, it's a new adventure. So I, I've, I've, just, I've just always, did, I've always kind of been that way. Now, I will say this. The older I've gotten, <laughs> the, the harder that is. <laughs> Uh, that, that is true. I, I know uh, we, when we moved here, actually it popped up on my memories uh, this week on Facebook. Uh, uh, I think five years ago today, uh, we were having some difficulty with the van lines we had contracted with to move here from Georgia. And uh, fortunately, we got out of that little contract with that crooked company. But <laughs> I won't name them online right now. Uh, but um, I remember telling Angela, we got, rid of, we got rid of a boatload of stuff before we came here because I said, I'm tired of moving this stuff. I don't like doing all this anymore. Um, but change has always been kind of an adventure for me, even from when I was a kid. But by and large, we don't like doing change. And um, even though we, I kind of talk about old versus young, the truth is uh, I was a youth pastor for a couple of decades. <clears throat> Teenagers don't like change any, either. They want it their way. It's just that their way is different than older people's way. But both groups want it their way. They don't want to change. It's just whatever. I remember a couple different times through the years uh, changing the youth camp that we were going to for, for various reasons. And I'll tell you what, you change the youth camp these kids are used to going to sometimes, and you just you, you get all kinds of, uh, of, of, of whining and complaining and moaning. And blah, blah, blah. And sometimes what we're trying to do is, sometimes there's, there's reasons for the change. There's, there's, sometimes we're just trying to make sure that, so one, one thing that happens is that you and I, we get in the habit of trusting our routine. We get in the habit of trusting the way it has always been. We get in the habit of trusting a program or a place or a location or this or that instead of trusting the God behind it. So sometimes God will do things to us just to make sure that we're not trusting that stuff as opposed to trusting Him, whether you're a teenager or whether you're not. But Jesus is changing everything about what they understand it means to be a disciple. They are now moving from, he's there, I hear him, I go there, he says do this, I go there, do that, to, he says, him leaving, they can't follow, and I'm going to send another called the, the comforter. And he's going, you won't be able to see him, but he's going to, teach you, he's going to remind you, and he's going to equip you to do not only what we've done, but even more so. And they're just probably going, oh, my head hurts. And if we think about it, we can understand why they would be thinking that, right? This is different for them. And so this is what's happening. He's actually changing the way they're going to interact with God and be followers of him. And he begins by talking this, but you're still going to do what I tell you to do. I'm going, I'm going to give you assignments. And the way I know that you love me and the, the, the way this is all going to work is that you will do what I tell you to do. And this is the proof. This is the evidence that you, in fact, love me. Now, does this mean that we only love God if we do certain things? Does this mean that we're only saved by our works? No, of course not. But... When we speak, and rightly so, when we speak of being saved or having a right relationship with God, not based upon our works, but through God's grace, through faith, when we rightly talk about that way, sometimes, if we're not careful, we can make a false separation. 
James lets us know, Jesus' brother, when he writes his little epistle near the end of the New Testament, we cannot separate faith from works. Faith is what saves us, not works, but works always accompanies faith. The way you know faith is real is it changes what you do. If it does not change what you do, if it doesn't change your behavior, if it doesn't change your attitude, if it doesn't change how you obey the, uh, how, how you obey the Lord, then it wasn't real faith to begin with. Genuine faith. We, we like to, I grew up as a Baptist, we like to talk about salvation by faith, and we talk about works over here. But the Bible doesn't really make that distinction. The Bible says you're saved by faith, but that faith will always, 100% of the time, produce change in what you do, and it will produce obedience. Otherwise, the faith wasn't real. This is what Jesus is talking about here. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you can't say you love God and not do what he says. Can you imagine what this conversation might have looked like? Jesus, in person, on the Sea of Galilee, tells Andrew, I want you to go over there and get that food. And Andrew says, mm, how about tomorrow? Can you imagine that conversation? Actually, can, can you really imagine Jesus in the flesh, six feet away from you, saying, I want you to go and do this, and you saying, mm, yeah, can you get someone else? I'm tired. Can, can you actually imagine telling Jesus no to his face? I can't. <laughs> um. I was scared of my dad when I was eight. I can imagine telling Jesus no. <laughs> um, and yet, so this, so this, this, is the, this is the model. Jesus says, listen, you're, you're not going to tell me no. Guess what else you're not going to, guess who else you're not going to tell no? The Spirit. <laughs> you, if you love me, you will do these things. Just because I'm not there in flesh and bone in front of you does not make the command to obey any different. Um, if you love him, you will do this. If he tells you to go here, you go there. If he tells you to do this, then you do that, whatever it might be. So this is going to be the new way. It's just going to be done through the Spirit instead of Jesus standing in front of us and flesh and, and, and blood. So he says, I'm going to ask the Father, and he will give you another, another helper. And you may have the word helper. Some translations may have the word advocate. It's generally translated helper. It is in Greek a word called paraclete. This word is used five times in Scripture, four times in John 13 through 17. Now, the word paraclete just literally has the idea of one who comes alongside. It's, it's that picture of someone kind of struggling and someone else coming up alongside them, kind of putting them on their shoulder and helping them through. There, there's that. It's not just it's not standing over here going, yay, good job, guys. I, I watched Arkansas play Auburn last night. Anybody else do that? Yay. <laughs> Some of y'all watched Arkansas beat Auburn, and I, I was very excited. And how much did I have to do with the outcome of that game? Zero. <laughs> Not a thing. But I took joy in it nonetheless. <laughs> but was I, was, I, was I a paraclete in the process? No, I was not. Now, maybe if I was in the crowd, I could have sort of said I tried to, but the reality is not really. To, to, to be a paraclete means to literally come alongside and be part of, to help, to strengthen, to encourage, to guide, to counsel. All has all that, it, it's, it's that someone who's there right next to you saying, yeah, I'm going to help you, I'm going to get you up, and we're going to get you over here because that's where the chair is at, and that's where you need to sit down and rest your leg that you just hurt. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's. It's giving, you, it's giving you advice, it's coming alongside you, it's giving you strength to actually do what you need to do. That's what paraclete is. And he says, I'm going to send you another helper. Now, I also want to hit on this word another here. There's two different ways, there's actually two different words in the, in the Greek language to talk about the word another. And here's the way, here's the way I'm going to illustrate it. If someone gives you a chocolate chip cookie, and you eat that cookie, and you say, I want another. Now, there's two ways to understand that. What's the first one? Oh, yes, it's another same kind. I want another chocolate chip cookie. Now, if for some bizarre reason you don't like chocolate chip cookies, 
if for some bizarre reason you'd rather have raisin oatmeal cookies. <laughs> I'll pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> so you could say, I want another. But what you could mean is a different kind. So another can mean something, a second one of the same kind, or it can mean a different kind. This is the word that means same kind. So when he says another helper, he is saying, I'm going to give you one, another one, but one like me of the same stuff, I'm going to give you another chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> now, obviously the illustration only goes so far, but when Jesus says to them, I'm going to give you another helper, he's telling them that he's going to provide them that the one that's coming, the paraclete to come, will be the same as him. What we call that? The Trinity. <laughs> We call that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But Jesus says, when I leave, you're going to continue to have God with you. You're going to have another helper. So you're going to have an, another one. And you can imagine what it's like to travel. I mean, we try to imagine what it would be like to travel with Jesus, to be walking side by side with him on the road, into Samaria, down in Jerusalem, all these different places, on the Sea of Galilee. These guys know what it is to be in a boat that they're about to drown in and have Jesus step up and take care of everything. They know what it is for, him to, for, for them to be facing a, a, a demon-possessed boy they can't do anything about. He comes in and he takes care of everything. They, know, they have seen firsthand he shows up and he takes care of stuff. That's comforting, isn't it? He says, I know that the fact, the idea that I'm leaving scares you. But the work is going to continue, and the one that's coming, the one I'm going to send, same, same stuff, same, same thing. It's still God. So that's meant to comfort them. Listen, it may not look the same, it may not feel the same, but it will be God with you in the, in the, in the form of the Holy Spirit, if you will. So how does that happen? How does, how, what does this look like to, for us as we continue to do, as the disciples were supposed to continue to do all that had been going on in the previous three years? What was that going to look like? He says this. He says, I'm going to, he's going to come. That the world's not going to receive him, but you are. So, by the way, the Holy Spirit doesn't come to everybody. This comes to those who are Christ's, those who have placed their faith in him. He says, the world won't even know him. He says, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not, I'm not abandoning, you, abandoning you. You're not going to be on your own. I want to come to you. The world's not going to see me for much longer, but you will because I'm going to live with you. I'm going to live in you. And when that happens, in that day, and we know that day to be Pentecost, that's when the Holy Spirit came, in that day you will know that I'm in the Father and you in me and I in you. Then he goes back to the commandments thing. All this is wrapped up together. The presence of Christ through the Holy Spirit. The command to continue the work. Just as if Jesus was actually physically right there. The peace and security that comes from His presence. All that is still there. So in the same way the disciples couldn't have ever imagined telling Jesus no, I would imagine. He says no is still not an operative word. You still don't get to use that word. <laughs> because the Spirit is there. So here's what he's going to, here's, here, here's what we're talking about here. I don't, in verse 22, Judas, not Iscariot. Now, I'm not sure I want to, I want to have to go through the life going, yeah, I'm the other Judas. <laughs> I think I would just change my name. <laughs> so Judas asks him, well, yeah, explain this all to you. And but then, what's, what do you mean, Jesus, what do you mean you're going to show yourself to us but not to others? And then Jesus pretty much says the exact same thing that he just said a, a second time. So, um, what's happening here? I want to, um, I mentioned that the word paraclete is used four times. It's used twice here in John chapter 14, it's used in John 15, it's used in John 16, and every time it's used in this conversation, Jesus has 
with his disciples in reference to the Holy Spirit. There's one other time it's used. Now, Jesus uses it four times here in the Gospel of John, but in the letter 1 John that, that the apostle would later write, in chapter 2, it's used another time. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, the apostle John writes this. He says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an... You probably have the word advocate there. Guess what word it is in Greek? Paraclete. It's the exact same word that Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And by this we know we have come to know Him, if we... Keep His commandments. I'm sensing a circular theme here. Now, when we see that word advocate, what do we tend to think of? What, what's, what's an advocate? Someone who speaks up for you. Okay. Someone who uh, uh, vouches for you or maybe represents you. We probably... There actually is a bit of a legal, you know, count, uh, lawyers are sometimes called advocates, but it's, it's that person who, who uh, counsels you and then speaks up for you. So if you're in a modern court of law, it's, you know, if, you're, if you've got a lawyer, that they're probably doing most of the talking. They're actually speaking on your behalf. They're your advocate. They go before the judge and they, you know, say all things, talk and all that type of stuff on your behalf. Now, in Jesus' day, in the, in, the, in, the, in the age of the New Testament, when we think of lawyers or advocates, that's not quite how it worked back then. If you are an advocate or a lawyer back then, your job is not really to defend or to prosecute. Now, today, a lawyer, you have the prosecution, you have the defense. We've all watched you know, uh, you know, uh, various lawyer crime shows. You know, ba -bong. Uh, <laughs> we've, we've all watched those. And we, we know, the, we know the, uh, the, the, the general roles of of lawyers. But in that day and age, lawyers weren't the ones who prosecuted or defended. Um, lawyers were supposed to be experts in the law. They interpreted law. They're the ones that said, yeah, that's right or that's wrong. But today we might, they feel more like judges in, in modern sense. Their, their role, in fact, you even see lawyers, you have experts in the law and scribes and Pharisees often coming to Jesus trying to test him on the law. The, the lawyer's job was really to interpret and understand the nuances of the law. If you were being accused of a crime, it wasn't a lawyer who was representing the prosecution. It was just some guy who, who said you did something wrong. And your defense was some guy vouching for you. So if so-and-so down the street says, well, Brett's doing this. And my defense wouldn't be a lawyer. It would be some guy going, no, man, I know Brett. He would never do that. And they would, be, they would be advocating for me in front of the lawyer who would be interpreting the law. So what we have in 1 John 2, Jesus is called our paraclete, our advocate, our helper, our encourager. Is He is in a role of standing before the Father and saying, I've paid, I've paid that price. They're actually not guilty. It's been taken care of. Uh, we tend to look at that verse in primarily a modern 21st century, 20th century legal way. But what's actually happening is this. Jesus is saying, I know this guy. And it's all taken care of. It's been, it's been wiped clean. There's nothing here to look at. That's what's going on here. That's, that's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> And on the other side, with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has now entered into our lives, and He is doing that on, on this end of the deal, so to speak. He is, on the one hand, He is one with the Father, He is one with the Son, so when the Spirit is communicating to us, this is what Christ has said, this is what Christ has meant, does He know what He's talking about? Sure. 
And on top of that, not only does the Spirit know Christ because they're one in the Trinity, the Spirit also knows us, right? Because He's God. And so knowing us and knowing Christ, He's advocating, He's counseling, He's advising, He's strengthening, He's doing all those things. He's paracleting. I think it's actually a verb, but hey, there you go. He's alongside us. He's saying, take a left here. <laughs> That's left. <laughs> the other left. <laughs> take, take her right here. Slow down. Don't go in there. <laughs> Don't open that door. That's bad news. This is what the Spirit is doing. And so Jesus is saying, listen, I know this whole thing scares you guys because I'm leaving, but let me tell you what. I need to leave so that I can send paraclete, so I can send the counselor, the advocate, the encourager, the strengthener, the counselor, and they're going to, he's, he's going to share with you all that I've said. He's going to remind you of the things that you forgot. He's going to point you in this direction. He's going to point you in that direction. It's going to be, and you're going to continue to do everything that we've been doing. In fact, even more so, you're going to go to places we haven't ever gone. You're going to see more people follow me than we've ever seen. You're going to do all these things. But it has to happen this way. It has to happen with him coming and me leaving. And he says in verse 23 and 24 again, he says, by the way, if you love me, he says it three times here. If you love me, you're going to do what I tell you to do. When I'm gone and the Spirit comes, if you love me, you're going to do all these things. You're going to continue to keep up with this stuff. You're going to go everywhere I say go. You're going to do everything I go. Uh, I, uh, I want just a little brief diversion here. There's an author named Sinclair Ferguson who's written some material on this sequence of chapters. And he, he talks about, just a little side note here, when we, when we begin this chapter in chapter 14, we go back to what we talked about last week, Jesus there is there in verse 3, that he's going to, and three, that he's going to prepare a place for us, right? Everyone likes that verse. Oh. You, you've heard it said, God created earth and heaven and the universe in seven days, but he's been walking on my mansion for 2,000 years. Well, okay. I got, a, I got a feeling whether God worked on it for 30 minutes or for 3,000 years, it's going to be pretty good. <laughs> That's probably not the point. He's going to prepare a place for us. But, Ferguson points out, not only is Jesus leaving to prepare a place for us, when the Spirit comes, the Spirit's preparing us for the place. Now, the big church word for that is sanctification. That is the process by which we are made Christ-like that we are made and shaped in holiness. And so as the, as the paraclete, as the Spirit comes to us and as we obey and as He counsels and as He advocates and as He shapes and as we obey, all these things happen. What's also taking place is that, yes, Jesus is preparing a place for us, but the Spirit is preparing us for the place. He's, 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 he's making sure that we're ready to be there. But even beyond that, I want to take this a step further. If the Spirit lives within us, if the Spirit dwells with us in our lives, who does that mean is living with us? What, what, what does that represent? It's God Himself, right? Now, we, we talked about this near the last portion of Revelation. There is a, one of the arcs of, of Scripture from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation, till the very end, is God with His people. And what takes place is God has cre he creates a place for His people, and He puts His people in there. He starts with Adam and Eve. And what do Adam and Eve do? They rebel, they sin. 
And so they are now separated from God because of that rebellion, because of that sin. And the, from Genesis 3 on, you have the account of God making himself known as he works to reunite those who have been expelled from the garden back towards him. And the last chapters of Revelation end with what? That taking place. And in chapter 21 of Revelation, Jesus it, it said, Behold, the dwelling place of God is again with his people. So he's been moving. That's what the, that's what the whole arc of history is moving towards. And while the Spirit dwells within us, so not only is He preparing us for a place, in a sense, a, a mansion, if you will, He's preparing us, and yes, he's, He is at the same time, for God to, for that moment when God is dwelling with us face to face. When, he's, when God says, these are my people and my dwelling place, my tabernacle is in the midst of the middle of my people. Now, that's, that's already true to a degree now because the presence of the Holy Spirit is within us. But there's going to be a day that we're going to see it face to face. And so this is the whole story. So one of the things that the Spirit is doing is not, not only is Jesus preparing a place for us, He's preparing us for that place. He's preparing us, for, he's preparing us to be the dwelling place of God. And uh, see, I'm, 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 going, I'm going to paraphrase C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis compares the Christian life. He says this, um, if you've ever, you ever done a home remodel, anybody ever done a home remodel or some construction in your house or something like that? And you ever get into it and find out it was a bigger job than what you... <laughs> always, it's, it's always a bigger job than you think, right? And C.S. Lewis talks about how part of what it means to be a Christian is, okay, I've turned over the keys to the house uh, to God, and I've expected Him to kind of transform me into, you know, something new. And then I find out about halfway through the project that this hurts a lot more than I thought it was going to. This is not what I expected. And what I thought was a nice little remodel is actually like extreme home builders. You know, it's what was the, you know, it's, it's a whole new house. <laughs> and I'm going, Lord, this is taking longer than the contract was supposed to take. <laughs> this is a bigger project. And, but what's happening is God's doing something more than we anticipated. We, we wanted a new room. <laughs> We wanted a paint job. We went, maybe, maybe we wanted to move a bathroom. And God says, I'm just going to do the whole thing. <laughs> so this is part of what the Spirit is doing within us as well. So he does this. And specifically there at the end of the passage, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit is going to, uh, to, to teach. He's going to remind us of what, he, of what Jesus has said. Um, the help, verse 26, the helper of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. So now you're going, wait a minute. How can I remember what Jesus said? I wasn't there. Fair point. So how do we remember? How can we be reminded of the things that Jesus said? Oh yeah, someone wrote it down. <laughs> That's nice. That's convenient. So I remember reading, and, and we've done, I don't, remember the, I don't remember the address, but I remember Jesus saying, and we, we, we quote it. Um, now sometimes we don't get the quote quite right. <laughs> um, but the Spirit can bring to our mind, and maybe you've had that moment. I, I, um, I don't want to put him on the spot. He's not here. Uh, ben had an encounter a few months ago in Russellville, he was in the library, and a guy just came up and started talking to him. And it's almost like the guy was looking for a spiritual conversation. And Ben goes, there's nothing about it. I was just you know, on my laptop because it wasn't anything. I didn't have any stickers on the back of my laptop that says, talk to me, I'm a Christian. You know, just, this, this guy just, and he began to question Ben about some spiritual matters, about, about the scriptures. And Ben said, I found myself referencing verses that he said, I, I know I kind of know, but I had to look them up afterwards and make sure I got them right. He goes, I did. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Guess what the Spirit does? He reminds us. He teaches. He makes clear the things that God, that Jesus has said. And, and 
And by the way, let me just kind of veer off here for a second. Yes, I get that a significant part of, of my role as a pastor in a church is this. <laughs> it's teaching. It's trying to bring things clear. You know, like we talked, we, we spoke about Ruth on Sunday morning. So one of the things we did was probably went into a little more history than normal, but to give us the context of what's going on. And so we have a better, clear, a better, more clear idea of what things mean when we read them. That's part of my role. But if your only understanding of Scripture is coming because you're relying upon me on a Sunday morning, you're in trouble. That's not enough. The Holy Spirit of God who does live in me, I believe, if you're a believer, lives in you. And that means that the Spirit of the one who said these words is in you and you have every ability to read the Scripture and to learn. Doesn't mean there's not a role for teachers who have more training or who have perhaps a little more time to spend on some of those backgrounds. But if the only time you learn anything about Scripture is when somebody else tells you it, <laughs> you're missing out. The Spirit of God lives in you. He's going to communicate with you. He's going to do this. This is, this is what Jesus has told us. So one of, the, one of the evidences that we are, in fact, believers is that we can sit down with Scripture and we can learn and we can understand and we can be reminded and that God works through His Word through the Spirit. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. A couple more things here before we're done. We're almost done. Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans there in verse 18. He says, the Holy Spirit's going to teach you and, and bring to your mind all these things. Now, I, I do want to do, as, as we wrap this thing up, I, I, um, uh, when, when, when Jesus teaches us, when the, when the Spirit guides us, when the Spirit whispers and encourages and strengthens us to go here and don't go there, sometimes we go the wrong direction anyway, don't we? We, we still sin. But one advantage of having the Spirit is when I sin, when I do turn the wrong way, it doesn't mean that I've lost my salvation. The Spirit doesn't stop um, being the Spirit. I don't stop being saved. When we sin as believers, while we don't lose our salvation, one thing that the presence of the Spirit will do is it will... It will make our response to that sin different. Um, let me let me let me share, let me maybe speak of it this way. I, I was I was having it's, it's, this is goofy. I get that, but just just roll with it. <laughs> I mentioned chocolate chip cookies a while ago. Suppose for whatever reason I don't know why that someone's offended by chocolate chip cookies. In our world, it could actually happen. I don't know, but. And by eating a chocolate chip cookie, someone I don't know over here is offended by my eating a chocolate chip cookie. I don't know them. And so if they come up to me and say, oh, I saw you eat a chocolate chip cookie, I'm never going to talk to you again, and they walk off. And I go, I don't even know who that is. Does that really bother me a whole lot? No. Well, <laughs> if someone I have no relationship says, I'm not going to talk to you anymore, I mean, I mean, I, I don't want that to happen, but I'm not particularly crushed by it. <laughs> now, as silly as it is, if someone I dearly value, who I've been known for 25 years, says, you eat that chocolate chip cookie, I'm never talking to you again, would that be different? I might still be confused, but... <laughs> And the difference is, I had a relationship, and losing it hurts. If I didn't have a relationship, losing that didn't hurt because there was nothing there to lose. If the presence of God and Christ is in my life and the version of the Holy Spirit, and I sin, well, I may not have lost my salvation. What has happened? I've hurt one I love. And the relationship is not dissolved, but it is you know, when you hurt someone, you've said you, you, need to, you need to repair. It's broken for a little bit, isn't it? 
and I feel it. That hurts when they won't talk to me. When, as Christians, when we have the Spirit of God with us, this is why Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. If we love Him and His presence is with us, and then I sin, now that sin and the hurt it causes that relationship, that actually bothers me. I, I don't like that. I don't want to be there. If I don't have the Spirit in my life, sin's not going to really bother me that much because I don't have a relationship to begin with. But if the Spirit's there and now I sin, now sin bothers me. This is why a Christian who says sin doesn't bother them, <laughs> ooh, that's a, that's a dangerous place to be. If someone doesn't know the Lord, I wouldn't expect sin to really bother them that much. They don't know Christ. But if you have the Spirit of God living with you, if you're one with the Spirit of Christ, and now you sin, mm, I feel that, because now we're not right. I, that, mm, I, I miss that. I, I miss that intimacy there because of my sense. So I want to get that right. This is why Jesus could say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Finally, he says there, after all that, verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not the world gives do I give it to you, but don't let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You heard me say I'm going away. I will come to you. If you, have, if you and if you love me, you would rejoice about all this. He, he, he says, I'm going to give you peace. That connected, by the way, that connected, it's the connected presence with the Spirit. I referenced it a while ago. These guys were at peace for the most part when Jesus was there because they knew if he's there, he can do things like tell a storm to shut up and he can heal things and he can say just the right words to get out of trouble. And You're hanging out with Jesus and it all kind of ends up working out the right way. He's not there. He says, don't worry, I'm still going to give you my peace. Now, what that means is this. Does it mean that the disciples and the apostles or even us won't have to worry about hard things and storms and pain? Does that mean that? No. It does mean that in the same way the disciples could be confident that they were in the physical presence of Jesus, that whatever circumstances happened, that the result would be the right one, that we still have that same peace. That whatever circumstances are in front of us, whatever difficulties or pain or whatever else, that in the presence of Christ through the Holy Spirit, the end result will eventually be what? The right one. That God will take that and do something that brings us to where he wants us to be, one way or the other. And so there's a peace that comes with that. The very last, Jesus says there in verse 30, I will not speak much more with you. He's got two more chapters, by the way, but <laughs> um, that's not really very long. He said, I won't speak much more with you. The rule of this world's coming. He has nothing in me. You know, that, that's a strange way of saying it, but here's, here's the modern vernacular. He's got nothing for me. Satan is coming, but he, he can't. <laughs> he, he didn't really have anything he could do to me. Now, remember, we started this in John chapter 13, this whole conversation with Jesus being reminded, Jesus himself knowing that all things, that means everything that's about to happen in these next 24 hours, all things said rested in his hands. So as Jesus moves forward to the Garden of Gethsemane, as the soldiers will show up, as he goes to trial, as all these things happen, it will appear that Jesus is a victim, that he's, part, he's being swept along on a tide of jealousy and false accusations, and he has been victimized by all of this stuff. And none of that is true. Jesus is not a helpless victim along the way. Everything that takes place is done in the power and authority and the control of his own hands. And so it will look like from the outside that Satan is winning, that the attacks are successful. And yet we know that that's not actually true. It's actually through those circumstances. It's through the trial. It's through the lashings. It's through the beatings. It's through the spitting. It's through the crucifixion. It's through death that victory is assured. All Jesus was doing was winning in a certain way. 
Yeah, I mentioned Revelation. This is, one of the, this is why Revelation is so significant. Revelation repeatedly tells us in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 that it is the persecution of the saints and even the death of the saints that assures their victory. Satan's defeat is actually assured through Christ's death and resurrection. And that means that even his followers sometimes will achieve victory in imitating and following Christ, which sometimes means death, but it also means resurrection. That's the assurance at the end of all this. Um, it will look in the coming hours as if Jesus is being defeated, but it could not be further from the truth. Death, his death will actually mean victory. So he can sit there and say, listen, all this is about to happen. Satan's going to come for me. He's not going to, he's got nothing for it. <laughs> it looked like it, but he's really not in control. And it's something good for us to always remember. All right. If you're watching with us online tonight, so glad you have joined us. Uh, we will be picking up in John 15 next week. This coming Sunday morning, we're going to be in Ruth chapter 1. We started that new study this past Sunday. I want to invite you to be part of that. I hope between the next few days that you have a chance to, to encounter the grace and uh, providence of our Lord. We're going to take some time to pray here tonight. So if you're watching with us online, I'd uh, recommend you do the same thing where you're at. Y'all have a good evening. Thank you.